scrap material. We never seem to get credit for good course. They claim that all the valves I've been returning have broken mounting flanges. I know the difference between a good mounting flange and a broken one. Who are they trying to kid? My core credit comes in, but it often doesn't agree with what I thought I should receive, and my customer has already been reimbursed for his core. I'm always out the difference. Sound familiar? Core processing is as vital to your business as it is to ours, and if not handled properly, cores can significantly impact your company's bottom line and our ability to provide you with quality remanufactured products. That's why we at Allied Signal Truck Brake Systems Company, the manufacturer of Bendix brake products, would like to talk to you about core processing. We developed this video to help you better understand our core procedures and policies. You will see firsthand how we process the cores we receive from you and ultimately determine your core credit. We'll also show you how to complete the necessary documentation and how to properly package the material for shipment. Let's first take a look at the core processing cycle. As you can see, the process begins with you, our customer. Your purchase of a Bendix remanufactured product triggers an automatic charge to your core bank, starting the wheel in motion. You, in turn, sell the product to your customer and recover a core. This is a vital step to the remanufacturing process because cores like these enable us to continue to manufacture and provide you with quality remanufactured products at competitive prices. Because of their importance to the remanufacturing cycle, cores on average are valued one to two times the remanufactured price. Once the core is recovered from your customer, you evaluate the core to determine the credit due to your customer. Proper identification, sorting, and grading is essential to ensure that you, in turn, receive the appropriate core credit. This portion of the cycle, which we will discuss in detail later in this video, requires product identification, or core acceptability. Core grading, which determines if a core is either a good core, one part damaged, or two parts damaged and processing or completion of all necessary forms and proper handling, packaging, and shipping. When we at Allied Signal receive the submitted core, our experienced core inspectors then complete the same evaluation process to ensure all cores are accounted for and processed correctly. To complete the cycle, we then issue a core maintenance report which identifies the type and quantity of cores submitted and the credit issued, as well as a monthly core activity report to keep you abreast of your purchases and returns and verify the cores you submitted were processed properly. After we have completed our evaluation, the core begins its journey through the remanufacturing cycle to once again become a quality remanufactured product. Now that we have taken an overview look at the complete core processing cycle, let's take a more in-depth look at the core evaluation and processing portion of the cycle. To assist you in your core evaluation, we will use core return memo forms, a core return handbook, the remanufactured exchange core classes wall chart, and the Bendix parts and Bendix truck products catalog. Let's first look at the core return memo forms. The core return memo form is used for recording the quantity and condition of the cores being submitted for core credit. The core return memo forms shown represent various product lines, Bendix air brake parts, hydraulic brake parts, and truck products components. The truck products core return memo forms are used for non-Bendix products that qualify for credit under the Bendix Truck Products Program. The correct form must be submitted for each core return to ensure proper processing. Although the forms must be completed in entirety, we will look at only a few of the key fields. 
At the top of the page is a pre-printed CRM, or Core Return Memo, number, which is used to reference your core return activity. The date of return is the date that you place the cores in transit to us for processing. To ensure credit for the month, returned cores must be shipped from your facility by the 15th of the month. And shipping information, such as the selection of the correct service plant, the bill of lading number, carrier, and indication of prepaid or collect shipping charges. Core shipments over 500 pounds may be shipped to us collect. The body of the core return memo form shown here is a tally sheet for the cores being submitted for credit. This is where the core quantities are recorded by product group, class, and core condition. Note that the shaded areas on the form indicate that credit is not available for the core and condition identified. After the products have been sorted and graded and are being prepared for shipping, the information is recorded onto the CRM. To assist in this process, we will use the Allied Signal Bendix Brakes Remanufactured Exchange Core Classes Wall Chart and Product Catalogs. The products discussed in this video are not representative of all acceptable cores. For additional assistance in identification, refer to the Bendix Product Catalogs. We'll start with a Bendix Compressor. Bendix compressors fall into three groups, as indicated on your core chart. Group 1 contains all flange-mounted compressors. Group 12 has all newer model base-mounted compressors and the side-mounted 2-Flow 501. And Group 13, consisting of all low-output, old-style compressors in both base and flange-mount configurations. Each group includes several different compressor models each with its own core classification. Note that a model designation may appear in both Group 1 and Group 12. The model designation, such as 2-Flow 750, is indicated on the compressor piece number tag. By visual inspection, we then determine the correct core group and class. If the tag is missing or illegible, the compressor must be identified visually. Here are some tips that may be useful in identifying the compressor group and class. The earlier compressor models, such as the Bendix 2-Flow 300, 400, 500, and so on, were comprised of three basic components, a cylinder head, cylinder block, and crankcase. The newer compressor models, such as the Bendix BX2150 and 2-Flow 501, 550, and 750, consist of a cylinder head mounted onto a one-piece crankcase and cylinder block combination. Most Bendix compressors consist of two cylinders, with the exception of the single-cylinder BX2150 and our four-cylinder models, the 2-Flow 1400, which has all four cylinders in line, and the 2-Flow 1000, where the four cylinders are opposing in a V configuration. The cooling medium used by a compressor also dictates distinct visual characteristics. As you can see on this 2-Flow 400 compressor, many older style compressors had fins on the head and or block to allow for more surface area for air cooling. If a compressor is air cooled, water ports are not included on the head or block. Compressors such as the 2-Flow 750 incorporate fins in the one-piece crankcase and cylinder body. However, the presence of water ports shown here in the head indicate that the compressor is water-cooled. The self-lubricated or self-lubed compressors have an oil-fill tube on the side of the crankcase, making them easily distinguishable from engine-lubricated models. The Bendix 2-Flow 500, 600, and 700 compressors are very similar in appearance and most often misidentified. Let's take a look. The Bendix 2-Flow 500 is available air-cooled, where the head and block contain the cooling fins, air and water-cooled, falling into the air-cooled core class, or water-cooled. 
The water-cooled two-flow 500 has two rounded bosses, one on each side of the two water portholes on the intake side of the block. The two-flow 700 is available water-cooled only. It will always have a boss on the side of the cylinder head, and in some cases this boss may contain a tapped or threaded hole or port. The two-flow 600 is a water-cooled compressor, and unlike the two-flow 500, it does not have the two rounded bosses on either side of the water ports, nor does it have the boss on the side of the cylinder head like that of the two-flow 700 compressor. Let's take a look at some non-Bendix compressors and some tips useful in their identification. To assist in this identification process, refer to the Bendix truck products catalog. First, we have the Midland EL1300 and EL1600 compressors. The EL1300 compressor is similar to the EL1600, except the EL1600 contains a raised rectangular boss located on the side of the block beneath the water port. Next, we have the Midland EL1320 and EL1300 compressors. As shown, the EL1320 is base mounted, whereas the EL1300 is flange mounted to the engine. The Midland EL13110, 16110, and 14110 are not acceptable cores under the Bendix Truck Products program and can be identified by round oil drain holes located on the bottom left and right sides of the flange. However, their replacements the EL13111, 16111, and 14111 contain triangular shaped oil drain holes and are accepted in the Bendix Truck Products program. Now that our compressors are identified and sorted by group and class, we must then determine the core condition. Looking at our core return memo form, we see that compressors can be submitted as a good core, one part damaged, two parts damaged, or as a competitive core to upgrade to a Bendix product. A good compressor core is one with no major components damaged or missing. As with all cores, each major component damaged or missing is equal to one part damaged. The damage is cumulative. Therefore, if two components are damaged, the core becomes a two part damaged core. A few examples of damage that constitutes one part damage are as follows. A crankshaft with damaged threads or splines. Broken cooling fins. Broken governor mounting pad. A missing or broken connecting rod. Or a broken crankcase at the mounting flange. Crankcase damage such as this hole in the side of the housing or a combination of any two one-part damaged components constitutes a two-part damaged core. Now that we have evaluated our compressor cores, let's take a look at some of our other products. Here we have fan clutches. There are four different Bendix fan clutch models that are or have been in recent production. The model designations are FD1, FD2, FD3 or Torque Master, and FDL or Torque Light. The easiest way to identify the various models is to read the identification tag located on the side of the mounting bracket. If the tag is missing or the information illegible, we then must identify by visual inspection. The circumference of the fan plates of the FD3 and FD2 fan clutches have a lip that does not appear on the FD1 and FDL models. The FD1 is distinguishable from the FDL as well as other models because of the cap screw securing the spring retainer on the front of the fan clutch. The other models have a dust boot covering the threaded shaft and nut. The FD2 and FD3 are very similar to one another and are the most difficult to differentiate. The only distinguishable markings are on the back side of the shaft. Turn the fan clutch over so that the dust cover is pointing down and the bracket end is up. Using a wire brush, 
clean the bottom of the shaft. You will see a six-digit number. If the last three digits are either 785 or 822, the fan clutch is an FD3. If the last three digits are 173, the fan clutch is an FD2. The fan clutches we have seen so far have been examples of good cores. All components were intact with no visible signs of damage. Here are some examples of damaged fan clutches representing a one-part damaged core. Damage such as a chipped fan plate, broken pressure plate, damaged or missing spring pack, chipped pulley, or a damaged mounting plate. The combination of any two of these situations would be considered two parts damage. The next product line we will discuss is air dryers. Looking at the remanufactured exchange core classes wall chart, we see that core credit is allowed for some air dryer assemblies as well as some of their components. Here we have AD2, AD4, and AD9 air dryer assemblies. In comparing the air dryers side by side, we can quickly identify the AD2 because it is much taller, approximately 21 inches in height, as well as smaller in diameter than the other two models. The AD4 and AD9 are similar in size and are easily mistaken for one another. Looking at the end covers of both, we can see the exhaust or purge port is located on center on the AD4 and off center on the AD9. Also note that the AD4 end cover casting incorporates 16 ribs and the AD9 only 7. Looking at the base of the canisters, we see that the AD4 is round, whereas the AD9 is contoured around the mounting bolt holes. Here are some examples of typical damage that is found on returned cores. Looking at the exterior first, we see a dented canister, a bolt broken off flush with the cover, a missing purge valve, a broken thermostat assembly, cracked or chipped end cover, and damaged or cracked ports. Removing the canister, we can see that the air dryer cartridge is intact. If the cartridge is missing, the core is considered one part damaged. One way to quickly determine if the cartridge is missing without removing the canister is by weight. The cartridge and desiccant material is approximately nine pounds in weight, which is a substantial amount when sorting through cores and should be easily detected if missing. An air dryer with two or more missing or loose cap screws securing the canister to the air dryer is suspect. The air dryer product line is the only product line we have where components such as the cartridges, end covers, and purge valves can also be returned separately for core credit. The air dryer cartridges are easily distinguishable from one another. The AD2 cartridges are straight across the top with a long cartridge bolt protruding from the center. The cartridges of the AD4 and AD9 are similar but the AD9 has a cartridge bolt extending about one inch beyond the bottom of the cartridge, while the AD4 does not. Referring to the core return memo form, we see that credit is issued for cartridges evaluated as a good core or one part damaged only. One part damage includes damage such as stripped threads or missing components. The AD2 and AD4 air dryer end covers and AD9 purge valve assembly must have no signs of visible damage or missing components to be an acceptable core. Next, we will look at our most extensive product line, valves. Valves are divided into 15 groups and 29 core classes. Sorting into group or class is done by visual identification if the piece number tag is missing. The remanufactured exchange core chart is necessary for identification. Due to the vast number of valves available, we will look into identifying only those valves that are not easily discernible. 
Push-pull valves such as the PP3 and PP7 are very similar in appearance. But looking at the bottom of both valves, we see the presence of a tripper exhaust hole located in the bottom of the PP3 valve. Limiting and quick release valves such as the LQ4, LQ5, and BP1 shown here are often misidentified. Let's take a closer look. The LQ4 resembles the other two without the 1 8 inch control port located on the front of the valve. The BP1 valve, which is not accepted under the core return program, is externally identical to the LQ5 and must be identified by the piece number tag. Quick release valves are often difficult to distinguish from one another. We currently manufacture four different valves, the QR1, QR1C, QRN, and QRN2. The QRN and QRN2 are non-metallic valves and are not accepted for core credit. The QR1C looks like the QR1 with an additional port on the front of the valve. Trailer spring brake valves such as the SR2, SR4, and SR5 are identified by first counting the number of spring retainers the valve has. A spring retainer looks like a cap protruding from the top of the valve, secured by four screws. Both the new and old style SR4 have two spring retainers, where the SR2 and SR5 have only one each. The distinguishing feature on the SR5 is a small hole located on the web of the body, which is not present on the SR2. The pressure protection valves are the last group of valves we will be sorting. The PR2 and PR4 are the two protection valves that are accepted for core credit. The PR2 is nearly identical to the RV1 pressure reducing valve, which is not a part of the core program. The only distinguishable characteristic is the presence of a valve spring located in the bottom port of the RV1. The PR4 is often mistaken for the PR3 valve which is a portion of the SR4 valve. Looking in the bottom of the valves, we can see that the PR3 contains a snap ring just inside the bottom of the housing, where the PR4 does not. The valves that we have discussed are those that are often incorrectly identified, and only a small portion of the valves that are accepted under the core program. We will now look at some examples of damaged valves. The damage may be presented on a specific valve, but in most instances is representative of all valves. Over-torquing or misalignment of fittings is frequently responsible for cracked or broken ports, or stripped threads, or mounting bolts being sheared off at the valve body, as well as cracked or broken bodies on valves that have cast-in mounting brackets, such as the quick-release valve. When sorting through the various products, you should also be looking for indications that the product is not a Bendix product. Indications like other manufacturers' names or company logos stamped or cast into the body or identification tag. Looking at the CRM, we see that some non-Bendix manufactured cores are acceptable for standard competitive credit when changing up to a Bendix product. As you can see here, the Midland FFV and FF2 valves are accepted competitive cores when an SR5 changeover kit is purchased. This changeover results in a credit applied to the changeover kit core bank. However, if you participate in the Bendix truck products program and your customer chooses to replace his non-Bendix component with a like unit, the core can be processed under the Bendix truck products program. Processing a core under this program requires that the truck product's core return memo form be completed and submitted with the return core. Under this program, the core is exchanged on a like-for-like -like basis. It is important to note that the values between cores processed under the standard competitive core program may vary significantly with the values under the Bendix truck products program. 
Next, we will look at our hydraulics product line. Hydraulic cores must be processed on the hydraulic core return memo form. Let's take a look at the calipers, which represent the largest portion of the hydraulic core program. Calipers are divided into three basic categories, the Bendix single piston, Bendix twin piston, and Dayton Walther twin piston configurations. Each can easily be identified by referring to the remanufactured exchange core classes wall chart and hydraulics core return memo form. Let's look into determining core condition. A bleeder screw that is broken off flush with the body is considered one part damage. However, the most common form of damage to calipers, excessive wear, is considered two parts damage. Excessive wear is defined as a groove or gouge worn in the caliper, rail, or V-way deeper than the thickness of a dime, or excessive wear on the rail. Excessive rail wear appears as a sharp edge, while a good caliper has a flat edge. We have now sorted and evaluated the air, hydraulic, and non-Bendix products. Let's take a look at your final steps in the core processing cycle packaging, and shipping. As you have seen, there are many examples of damaged cores that are shipped to us daily. Unfortunately, many times the damage occurs in transit due to poor packaging techniques. Cores should be packed neatly with the heavy items on the bottom of the pallet. If more than one layer of cores are being packed, it is best to place a layer of cardboard between each layer of parts. Some products need extra care in handling, such as the Bendix Hydromax, and should be packaged individually before placing in the pallet box. When packaging returns, a basic rule to follow is don't overpack pallet boxes. A box may appear fine when it leaves your dock, but in transit, a weight shift or jarring could cause components to tear through the sides of the box and eventually destroy the entire box causing cores to be lost or damaged. Warranty returns may also be packaged with core returns, although it is best to ship the material separately to expedite your warranty credit. If the material is packaged together, insert the warranty form in the warranty envelope provided and attach to the product with the wire tie. Pack the warranty material in a separate container and place in the top of the core return pallet box. After securing the box, attach the pink copies of the completed core return memo forms. These copies will serve as your packing slip for shipment. The white and canary copies of the core return memo forms are then mailed to the appropriate service plant for processing. We at Allied Signal Truck Brake Systems Company would like to thank you for your time. We hope this has given you a better understanding of the core processing cycle from your purchase of a quality Bendix remanufactured product to the remanufacture of a returned core, as well as how proper processing impacts your business and our ability to continue to provide you with quality Bendix remanufactured products.